นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทธังธรรมังสังฆังนามาสามิโอเคโซตัมมาเรฟเฟกชันทูไนท์ไอวอสโตรเดตตัวท็อปิกวุฒิปีอ่ะบอลคัมมะเจสต์เดอะลาสต์มินิทวิชิสโอเคคัมมะอิสเวอร์ยคุดท็อปิกอันนี้เว้ยโซอิสเวอร์ยคอนเซปต์ที่อิสเวอร์ยเอเซนเชียลอินบุริสม์นะอิคอร์เดอะเดอะ Mundane right view, uh, the view. Uh, in Buddhism, you have two kind of right view. Right? The first one is called the, the mundane or the worldly right view, and the second one is called the, the supra mundane or the the path, uh, the sam s a m m a t i t i This is re- involved the the four noble truth. Uh, so. Before we jump into the four noble truth, we have to start with this mundane right view. Uh, it's called the law of karma. Uh, actually, there's ten of those <laughs> things that you have to have a right view before you even start practicing. Uh, it's called the mundane right view. Uh, uh, it's very interesting topic. Uh, because I think if you are the, a Buddhist, and uh, you probably familiar with four noble truth, I know you probably hear it many many times. Uh, yesterday was the visa, you know. So, uh, what what define what chain between Bodhisatta and the Buddha? <laughs> What's the difference between Bodhisatta and Buddha under the Bodhi tree? Uh, the d- difference is that. Uh, under the Bodhi tree, Bodhisatta discover these four noble truth: uh, suffering, cause of suffering, uh, end of suffering, and the path to the end of suffering. That why he become the Buddha. <coughs> But he, before that, <laughs> so it take a long time. Uh, Bodhisatta, he practicing for many many life. Uh, if you read the c h a t a k a story, it's not just. Last life that he tried to do this, he do it many many time. Uh, some life he born as an animal, uh, getting killed. Uh, some life he was born as a poor, getting beaten almost to death. Uh, some life he was born as an ascetic, uh, severely practice austere in the forest. Some life he was born as a king, having the old kingdom to protect. Uh, so he been through many many lifetime, uh, and at each lifetime he perfecting what we call the parami. And each one of them is, he always have this uh, one question. Uh, we call it the one quest of the bodhisatta. It's called the uh, what is the the wholesome thing, the the most wholesome thing in the world. Basically, he he search for what is the thing that we should do that is the the most important thing or the most uh, uh, the highest form of the wholesome called kusala in in the Pali term. Kusala means wholesome. So basically, he search for what is the most wholesome action in the world that human being can accomplish. So this is the driving force of his. We call the Bodhisatta career, and it will fulfill at the night of uh, yesterday night, the Visakha Puja, the full moon of May. He able to finally got this uh, basically what called the the highest form of the k u s a l a k a m a We call it Makkha path. Uh, it's path towards the we see the Nibbana for the first time. But before that. Uh, just back, backward a little bit. Uh, is uh, 
the the trust or the understanding of the karma is almost like a very essential. You know, if you look at the ten lists of this uh, mundane right view, you know, for example, the first one is they say the dana, uh, the dana is there. The, the generosity have some result, and then the next one is the well, basically the the gift that you offering uh, during the big event, and then you offering to the poor, uh, offering to the guests, and sometimes offering to the deva and the higher beings. They also have the result, uh, and then they're talking about the mother. Uh, is is uh, uh, you have to uh, believe in the the act toward the mother and the act toward the father is is special. It's not like you do it to other people, you know, because a father and mother is you have a special karma connection to them. Uh, so any act that you do toward them is is very special. It's also powerful as well. Uh, you look at like Onkulimala, uh, he killed 999 uh, people. He about to kill his mother, and the Buddha had to uh, basically go and, and stop that, and basically teach him Dhamma, and he become Arahant. But if he kill his mother, there will be no, <laughs> no hope for him. He will go straight to hell. So that means that certain people in your life it's very important. It's not like everybody else. So if you even if, uh, able to kill your parents, then it's no hope for you. You go straight to hell. <laughs> even the Buddha can't help. You know? So this is the thing that you know, in this you know, certain karmic connection, certain people are very, very important. And then there are also rules about uh, this world, uh, the, the last, uh, the next world is there. You know, if people believe that this, this, this is it. You know, when you die, everything go into uh, emptiness. Then you not believe in law of karma because the karma is cause and result. Uh, if you still have cause, then the result still follow. Uh, so if you have this life and you have not finished your duty, you haven't abandoned the unwholesome, you haven't fulfilled the wholesome. Then the next slide will come. You know, either you believe it or not, it will not just end like that. You know, I think many spiritual practices, they, they, they want to go straight to Nibbana. Uh, so they want to deal with any, any karma or anything. You know, just, okay, I'm just sitting, realize for no truth and become the Buddha. And then Bhikkhu Bodhi just stand up and say, this is strong view. So uh, for me, I still remember to this day that he went a lot of. Uh, importance on this mundane right view that you can't bypass it. Actually, before you ever, ever practice, you have to set your, your karma in, in the right thing. You know, basically, you have, basically, the fact that you keep the sila is the fact that you appreciate the law of karma. Because if you break the sila, then you already create the unwholesome karma. And then Vipaka is going to come. I mean, you're not going to be able to sit still and meditate, contemplate for noble truth because you do a lot of nasty things, but you want to kind of bypass that. Yeah. So the fact that you keep the sila is already tell one level that you have to have this law of karma in your mind. And also not only sila, yeah, there are also the, the etiquette, all this, uh, we call the vata. Uh, the sila is something that uh, basically to refrain, not to do this, not to do that. But there are also the things that you have to do as well. Uh, for example, if you have a parents who are uh, ill parents and you basically you don't care about them, you just go to the meditation <laughs> uh, cushion and basically close your eye, uh, then your meditation will probably not go very far because you need to do that duty first. You know, are these things you know, thing they have to take care of? You know, not only the sila, but the wet water, you know, the, the duty toward your you know, people around you, things like that, that you have to be setting in, in according to the Dhamma. You know. So it's very, very interesting of how 
how the uh, even the scholar like Vikku Bodhis, he probably the most expert in the in the Tipitaka, you know, he know the teaching of the Buddha and uh, come to that conclusion. Because they also we need we need uh, now today like people want to uh, basically follow the the scientific evidence. Uh, this also happened in Thailand as well, where they say, okay, we live in this God and you know, ghosts and Deva and all this spontaneous rebirth and thing is is outdated. It's not really in line with the uh, with the scientific findings and things. So there are some movement in terms of remove all of this uh, life many many life cycle of the last previous birth and thing they just just focus to this here and now and this life and some people uh, really buy into that I guess in Thailand we are so um, lean on too much of that as well in the in the old day people are just stuck with this karma uh, whatever you do thing what wrong in this life you always blame this on the past karma yeah. which is maybe too much as well you know see the buddha said if you say that everything is according to the uh, previous karma then you go too far because there are many things that it just <laughs> happen uh, cause and condition for it is is here and now it's in this lifetime it's not the past life of course there are some that from the past life, but not all. Like for example, the illness, it can be from the imbalance of the, the earth element, fire element, uh, uh, air element, wind elements, yeah. or it can be by the new karma, or the action that you do this life. And it can be from uh, other people attack you, kill you, yeah. this can be the new karma as well. So, Previous karma played a role, but not not everything. Sometimes people lean toward that everything they blame on the past karma. Yeah. We have one one uh, drunken in the monastery, and when we try to tell him, you know, you, you come to the monastery, you should be sober, you should be not drinking. You know, it's uh, in a in a temple, but he said it's my karma. <laughs> How can you blame that on your karma? You're just drinking in this life, you know. Yeah. So this is not work. You know, when you try to blame everything on your karma, you, know, you you misunderstand the concept. The karma means, of course, there are past cause and condition, but right now it's also karma. You can create new karma right here and now. And the fact that you drink alcohol is a <laughs> karma that you do right now. You can't blame it on the previous life. You know. So this is this is the thing that. Uh, most people uh, misunderstood, especially in, in Thai uh, culture. Sometimes they believe in that, but sometimes we go on the opposite end as well. Like uh, this, this new generation, they try to disregard all this past life. This is kind of superstition. It's everything is just here and now. You know, I'm just because my parents just, uh, actually my mother and father doesn't have any special karma connection with me. They just. They just want to enjoy themselves and to, to just have me. Basically, uh, is uh, I'm I'm not do anything to them. Uh, actually, they're supposed to take care of me because they make me happen. You know, they have responsibility for my life, and I don't have to pay them any back. Gratitude. You know, many people these days they believe on the opposite side, and one of the 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 monks who are quite he, he quite modern on his day it's called uh, Lumbo Buddha Dasa. I don't know you read his book or not he's very modern into the interpretation so because he know that in Thai society people tend to uh, interpret in terms of previous karma so he always emphasize on this only this life you know, he basically he doesn't explain about the past life so much some people misunderstood that he was uh, basically denying the past life and all this uh, uh, cycle of rebirth and you know previous life and everything, um, but actually there were, we we have a, a chance uh, in our 
we forward by the national, the national forest monastery. You now we have many westerner who ordain our tradition. It's called Ajahn Chah tradition, Thai forest tradition. So I have one uh, teacher called Ajahn Pasanno. He's a, a Canadian monk, and he told me that one time he went to this uh, Baba Buddha Dasa, and he also because he read a lot of his book, he said, oh, "Okay, yeah, I'm." I'm agree with you of our interpretation of only this life that matter. But then Lumpur Buddha has tell him that for you, <laughs> you need to uh, pass life is, is true for you. You have to believe in that. See, he, you, the teacher have to see where you are at and he will emphasize on that. Like for the Westerner, because they not believe in past life. So they have to believe in that. It's very important. You know. I think if you not believe in past life, um, you might not stay as a monk for so long because you think, why would you uh, basically, uh, almost like you trade off the, the worldly pressure to be a monk, like you, or maybe you miss something. And maybe some of the monk, maybe, maybe they get too old. They just disrobe and they just, just enjoy, you know, have the family or whatever, companionship because they don't want to lose everything. But if you believe in past life, then it makes your monkhood stay longer because, I mean, you've been everything. <laughs> you've been having a family. You've been, you know, you've been the king. You've been the robber. You've been killed. Uh, only thing you haven't been, you haven't get enlightened. That's why still you still here. So this is, uh, if you can do anything, this is something that you can do new, basically. Be a monk and then get enlightened, and this is what new. Everything else is not new. It's just recycle thing over and over and over. So I think that is uh, very important. Uh, I think we have a discussion one in, in Wat Banana Chat about what is a prerequisite for monk to ordain. Because uh, there are one uh, teacher say, if that person doesn't believe in past life, then maybe we shouldn't ordain them because they are probably not past long. But then the other teacher said, well, most of the Western doesn't believe in past life. So uh, we should give them the opportunity. Yeah. But I think the conclusion is that if they really deny the possibility of past life, I think that probably not qualified for being a monk because they're not going to be a monk for so long. You know, they just come in for uh, meditation. They won't have some blissful experience. But once after they face difficulty, when the time gets rough, they probably disrobe because they don't have any faith in that. Why, why would you have a faith if you think when you die, everything is go to nothing? You know, like, like, uh, like, like Hitler and Ajahn Chah or Dalai Lama, when they die, just go to the same place. <laughs> well, it doesn't make sense to practice, isn't it? I mean, you, if you believe that when you die, everything finished, then what's the point of pursuing this thing? But because it's not finished, it's go on and on and on. You know, life is like that. You know, cause and condition is still there. See, that's why the law of karma is very important. You need to have that in, at least by faith, if you're not seeing it directly. Of course, I mean, very, probably very few people can recall past life. Uh, not directly, uh, because we are. <laughs> we just remember this life is probably busy enough. If you if you want be uh, memorize the past life, it could be a lot of trouble. You know, you, know, you used to be my mother. You used to be my wife. <laughs> so it could be <laughs> go to trouble. So that's why the nature make it easy. You you got the reset. Uh, you reborn you. Forget everything, you just start new, start fresh. But there are many cases, you know, if you know, like in the world, you know, repeatedly people who recall their past life. You know, there's a the professor in the in Virginia University, I think his, uh, his name is Stevenson. He collects this case, I think 2,500 cases now. Uh, so he basically send the team to investigate in terms of uh, sometimes, usually they keep about between two and four. They start to say something very weird about their past life. But, you know, if you are 
suspicious. You never know whether these kids are listening for somewhere or not. So when this thing happened, now they they send the team to basically investigate where do this thing and document everything and find out the, the whatever the kids say. Are they anything refer to that in the past or not? And they actually they find a lot of evidence that it's very true. The the memory that this kid has is a. Uh, it's pretty in line with what really happening in the past. So how how are you gonna explain this this uh, this uh, evidence? It's scientific proof. <laughs> in many ways, you know, some people who doesn't believe in rebirth. Oh, by the way, it, it's called rebirth. It's not reincarnation. It's totally different concept. The re reincarnation is concept of Hindu, where you have this soul, this atta. Basically floating, you know, when you die, you, this atta basically pop up and then go up and then reincarnate, go in another fresh, and then become that person. So this is this is not what the Buddhist Buddhism taught. Is not reincarnation. It's called rebirth. Rebirth is different. Yeah. Rebirth is the the whole process. It continuous. It's like the process of continuity. The consciousness arises and passing away, arises and passing away, but in the these realms of being, in the last consciousness, when this last consciousness arises and passing away, is end here. But because you still have this karma, you have the gilesa, uh, the all this defilement, greed, hatred, and delusion, and all the previous karma that you did in the past. Basically, that karma will almost like. Uh, Propel this consciousness to reappear in the next life according to your karma. So if you are, if you did the action of killing a lot of animals or whatever, cheating, stealing, cheating on your wife, lying, anything. So if that last my moment, basically recall one of these karma, then that the next consciousness will continue on in the. Whatever, maybe hell or animal, depend. If you are uh, full with hatred, uh, you violent, you are born in the in the hell realms. If you are stealing, uh, greedy, you are born in the hungry ghost. If you are kind of delusion, <laughs> don't know, you could born in animal. So it basically will find the right realm for your consciousness. And your quality of consciousness is at that time is match that kind of. Realm. So it's continue on. It's like you have this, this candle. You lit the candle, right? The the frame in this candle. How how can this frame come about? Because you have a wick, you have a candle, you have oxygen, right? So it's going up. Actually, the candle also, the frame is also arising and passing away very quickly because uh, each moment is depend on different wick, different candle, you know, different oxygen, right? But it's happen very quickly, you see it's almost like stable, but actually it's a stream, a stream of that frame. It looks like it's a stable, but it's not. It's kind of wiggling all the time. And then when when the wick and the candle small, small, almost to, to go away, and then at the last moment, before this, this frame go away, you, you have another candle and then get the light from this. Now, the light from this come to this, right, the new candle. Can you can you say that these light are the same? It's not. But is it just different? It's also not different. But because of this frame, cause and and condition this frame in this, everything is new, right? The oxygen, the wick, the candle, even the frame itself is new. But it's the continuity of this frame. So this is a concept of what we call rebirth. It's go on. Life go on because the karma is still there. Gilesa and Kama is there, it will propel you on this continu- continuity of this, of, this, uh, of this consciousness and will match whatever your consciousness at that moment is and you will stuck in that room for another whatever 500 years depending on your, your Kama. So this is, this is very, I mean for the Buddhists we can answer this evidence very easy that this kid, they <laughs> They have the same stream of consciousness from the last one. Now they take a new rebirth. And actually, it's only few people who can recall it because if you have to reborn as a human being as well and not too long, 
Uh, usually, usually they say the case when people die and when they reborn is not not a big gap, maybe ten year, uh, maybe some five year or ten year, uh, because they 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 have to have. If they too long, then they probably flash with a new memory. They probably not uh, remember it. If if they be born in the heaven or hell, then probably it's a long time as well. So maybe they go to some temporary, and then they right away they take another uh, rebirth as a human being, which is also rare as well. By the way, uh, to be born as a human being is very rare. It's a it's a opportunity that is not happen very uh, often. You have to have this at least five precept to be be born as human being. So it's not surprised why most people might not be uh, remember the past life because your past life might not be human beings and your past past life may be somewhere else or maybe somebody come straight from hell, <laughs> somebody and maybe descend from the from the deva and the mind. You can see the quality of the mind and the mind is uh, uh, deeply depend on the previous life as well. So this is kind of the thing that uh, this. New generation might need to take that into consideration. Whatever your philosophy, uh, you have to be able to explain this evidence. Uh, but I, I try to explain this to to my friend. He is uh, he kind of uh, atheist. He doesn't believe in this thing. Uh, you know what his answer is? You know, I said, okay, well, if you if you believe everything is finished, uh, die, everything gone, then how if you are Scientists, how can you explain this uh, evidence that they document in 2,500 people? And then actually, they, they select about 200 cases that it well proved, and then wide out to 20, which is very, very strongly proved. They have go to interview, and some people they even have this kind of birthmark. You know, like if you are die in the past life by maybe somebody kill you, like shooting, and you have this birthmark, the same. Word map is with that, so they have document like twenty clear, undeniable truth that this is not something that add on to to the children head when they are born. They are really something. So when we face with that evidence, how do you answer them? And you know what what he said? He said, "Well, it's very interesting. Maybe this this uh, this boy or this girl stole the memory of the dead." <laughs> So they still see this as a new entity, but somehow he kind of used the memory of somebody who died along. So he doesn't see that as a continuity of one stream of consciousness. So I think you can always come up with your explanation, but then you have to explain how how can some people steal the memory of other people? I mean. And then who are you then? I mean, if, if you go to bed tonight and tomorrow you wake up and you have a memory of your friends, would you be your friend or you be yourself? You know, it's kind of interesting to ask that philosophy question. So who do you identify with? You know, in, in Buddhism, we have these five aggregates, right? The body, the feeling, uh, perception, the mental formation, and the consciousness, which is called the five khanda, that we attach to it, either one or all or whatever, and you Define that me and mine. Anyhow, it's actually none of it belong to you anyway. But you are usually you identify with that five thing, and then you, as far as you identify with it, you still trapped in this samsara, you know, getting reborn again and again according to to your karma until you understand the four noble truth and find a way out. Uh, but in the beginning, the law of karma is very important. See the the Buddha normally he he will not go around and debate with other sects so much. He prefer to be basically uh, teaching just the uh, lay people who come to him uh, teach away. But there are some occasion where he actually go out of the way to debate, especially for the for the ascetic or the 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 wrong view who stub into this wrong view of no karma. Because I think he said that he he see that the Buddha see that when you have this wrong view of the no karma, it's really bad for you and bad for the disciple who follow that teaching. Because when you don't know about the karma, then you can't differentiate between the wholesome and unwholesome. And see that is is a key 
before you even understand the Four Noble Truths. Yeah. The first principle is you have to know. You have, but first you have to believe in action have the result. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then there have to be two kind of action, which called the wholesome action, will bring the happy result, mm-hmm. happiness as a result. And there's an unwholesome action, which bring the dukkha or the suffering as a result. So this is have to be very clear. If any sect or any cult doesn't believe in that, the Buddha go all the way to debate that. You know, he always say, you know, this is not a good philosophy. You know, so he basically he see the importance of uh, understanding the law of karma correctly, especially in terms of what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, because it will determine the whole thing, right? The whole teaching of four noble truth. You know, you have this uh, suffering, and you know, the Buddha, you know, you know this. Chakka, Dhamma Chakka, the Buddha teach in the first sermon. Yeah. So this is the Four Noble Truths, right? This is the, the suffering, the, the cycle of the birth, birth and death, go on and on and on with I in the middle. And so this is called the suffering. And this, uh, this tree is called the craving, it's a cause of suffering. Uh, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for existence, craving for non-existence. So this is tree that spin <laughs> The cycle of this is called the the power chakra, the the row of existence, uh, and then you have the niroda, the end of suffering, and this uh, eightfold path samurai into sila samadhi and panya, uh, three four training. So this is the the noble eightfold, uh, the four noble truth, uh, composed of the all that you think you need to know the dukkha, samuttaya, niroda, and then makkha. So basically, the unwholesome is the is the craving that you have to let go, right? The suffering you have to understand, you have to acknowledge, you have to study, you have to learn what it is you know, as a suffering. And then the craving or unwholesome you have to abandon. Right? And then the gusara or the wholesome you have to cultivate and to bring it to fulfill. And then when it's fulfilled, you can see the niroda. So this is a basically the understanding of the karma right there. You know, this is the cause, this is the result. Yeah? The cause of suffering is from craving. You know, these three types of craving and this cause is suffering. And the makkha, it, you can say it's cause uh, niroda, but not in the same way as the uh, craving cause dukkha. Yeah? Craving is the basically causing the dukkha directly. Yeah? This is when you have craving, the result of that, the vipaka of the craving, you be the dukkha in whatever form. But when you practice Noble Eightfold Path, it makes you reach the Nibbana. Because Nibbana is uncaused, it's unconditioned. So the, the path doesn't cause the, the, the destination. Right? For example, like you have a city, yeah, but you have a vehicle. The vehicle causes you to reach the city. But it doesn't create the city. The city is already there. The same way, this makkha will bring you to see or to reach the nibbana. But it doesn't cause the nibbana because nibbana is uncaused, it's unconditioned. It was the ultimate truth because it's unconditioned. It's what there all along. But because we are trapped in this five khanda, we we believe that this belongs to me and mine. So we we basically overlook the the nibbana. So we need this this uh, noble uh, noble eightfold path for us to reach this this nibbana so this is another basically before even you have to understand the four noble truths you have to have understand of karma uh, in terms of the bad karma on this side uh, the unwholesome causing dukkha and then wholesome causing nibbana which is the end of dukkha so this is two pair the uh, buddha just teaches in a different way this is just a pair of this karma Unho- uh, unwholesome karma and wholesome karma to the excellent. You know, when you have the the wholesome karma come to unite, this is the thing that the Buddha find out at the night of enlightenment, where he reached this uh, wholesome, the the maximum or the ut- utmost, the perfect wholesome. When this noble age will pass combined and he were to reach nibbana, and then that will be the end of suffering. Yeah. See, so he, he, because he realized that he became the Buddha, this, this is mean the, the carrier of Bodhisattva stopped 
and then the Buddha start. So this is the, the night that we, we say this, uh, uh, the birth of the Buddha. Actually, some people think it's the birth of the Buddha when he was walking uh, from, but the, actually the, in, in the word it says, Buddha Upanno, the arise of the Buddha, mean, mean this, basically, he become the Buddha. Uh, yeah, the, the Buddha arise, the Buddha birth under the body tree yeah, by enlightenment. Yeah, the, the body quality combined, uh, the makkha combined, so he able to gain uh, nibbana, which is the ultimate dhamma, that end the suffering. So this this is a day that he become a Buddha, uh, the bodhisattva changed into the Buddha, and we call it the Buddha day or the Visakha day, and it required a lot of uh, practice, a lot of uh, we have to abandon the unwholesome, especially the three root of unwholesome, greed, hatred, and delusion. And then you have to cultivate this wholesome sila samadhi and panya up to the point where it's combined and unite and able to cut. That's why in the, in the symbol you see this, this wheel of dharma, this nibbana, cut this gilesa. So, so this is the, when you see this, the turning the wheel, it's not this wheel because this wheel already turning. It's, you already dead. You know, go around and around uh, in circle <coughs> because of the uh, the the existence. You know, basically, this one is, you don't have to practice anything. You know, everybody born with kilesa and result is suffering. And you're gonna do that again if you not understand this four noble truth. But once you understand, you perfecting the the makkha and you reach really the nibbana. Nibbana is the is the will that cut this, basically cut this and then this gone. That's why this called the the okay mudra. Right? Okay, okay. You need to practice. This one is not okay. If you born like this, you will be dying and, and born again and die and born again. You, it's, it's no end to it. Yeah. Everybody have it. You you don't need to be. But if you are Buddhist, then you have this thing that Buddha teach, you know, the three four training and the nibbana, which is will cut through this. So, so at the night the Buddha get enlightened, he developed this makkha, he cut this gilesa. But the dukkha is still there actually. He, he doesn't vanish under the body tree, right? He still have the body. Because the dukkha is still the result of the previous karma that he has done. Yeah? So he still have this body, which he used for 45 years. He used this dukkha, this burden, carry his body around, you know, uh, going for arm, giving a teaching for 45 years. Until the last day, when he Paridipana, the same day on the Visakha day, 45 years later, he put down this Dukkha, this five Khanda. So now, he just, it's just Nibbana, <laughs> only thing left, right? When you put down the Dukkha, it's just uh, the Nibbana. So he's still there. He's <laughs> In the Nibbana, if you see him, if you are able to practice until you reach Nibbana, so you know where the Buddha is now. And so if able to put out the suffering, he uh, reached the immortal, you know, because immortal because he's not born. Anything that born will die. If you not want to die, then not get born. So that <laughs> that the concept. So the Nibbana is the unborn and undying. It's there. Uh, it's timeless. It's beyond time. I mean, you can reach there to practicing Makkha, the Noble Eightfold Path. So this is the, the message that uh, Buddha gave on the Visakha day, you know, the arising of the Buddha nature, you know, understand the Four Noble Truth. And then 45 years later, the same day, he put down these five khanda, this five khandas, this thing that we grasp as me and mine for many, many lifetimes, wandering on and on and on without understand. You know. Normally the Buddha, uh, Give the similar of the sankhara. Sankhara means formation, and the whole whole uh, body and mind formation. We, we call it sankhara. It's, it's combined. It's putting things together. It because of cause and condition thing come together. The Buddha usually compare that with the banana trunk. Uh, do you know what banana trunk is? Yeah. Usually, all people know because you <laughs> in the old day. Banana is everywhere. You can barely cut. In the old days, you don't even have a toy. 
where you have you have this banana trunk where you cut and you make this horse and you all those things. But this new generation, they don't they don't know what banana trunk is. So when you tell them the sankara is like banana trunk, they have an empty face. <laughs> what is banana trunk? So you have to change the simile. Yeah. So now when you explain to the new generation, you tell the sankara is like the onion. Yeah, I think everybody you know onion, right? You go to the supermarket, you find onion. When you cut onion, it's it doesn't have anything except a ring, a ring on top of the ring. So when, if you want to find the essence in the Sankara, it's nothing there. You're searching for the essence. Who am, who am I? Am I uh, who is a real me? And it's no real me. It's just a Sankara, you know, causing condition, causing this. So the onion is like that, the perfect simile for that. And you, if you look at the word onion, O-N-I-O-N, -N, right? So it's on and on with I in the middle. <laughs> so that, that what you are, you are, you are think you are some, somewhere in there, and you, be, you become something else all the time, according to cause and condition, trapped in this five kanda, grasping this one over and over again, because you don't know this four noble truths. Yeah. So you're trapped in this onion. Yeah. So, so be, rather than become your onion, you become okay. You, know? you, you practice this noble eightfold path and realize the nibbana and this is what the message the Buddha gives that you have potential, you're almost there you're born as human being you have this ability to understand what is right and wrong you know what karma is if you don't, you try try unhold something and see whether the result is being you suffering or not and try to break the precept <laughs> uh, but maybe some of them might take long time you know? because if you do something and you get the result right away no people don't be probably do any bad thing because <laughs> but because it takes time it doesn't happen right away but it will come for sure <laughs> if you believe the buddha if the buddha had this power of many many lifetimes he can recall many lives so he can tell okay this act this result is coming from <laughs> what happened but we don't have that we just have to rely on trust that this is this, and the buddha always say this is what happened when you do something, it's always come. What go around, come around. What you do, it will come back the same thing. So this is the thing. So you have to at least have the belief or faith in the law of karma. You can take it as a working hypothesis. If you don't have that, you don't have anything to work with. So if you do unwholesome thing, the result will be suffering. It's like basically this. If you do wholesome thing, the result will be happiness. The supreme happiness is Dibbana. And this is called the, you, know, you have the, the black karma and unwholesome, and the white karma. And then you have the, the maka, which is the beyond, it's no black and white. And basically, when you have the maka, it's go beyond this black and white already. It's, you are reaching the nibbana. When you're reaching the nibbana, it's no longer karma. See, the arahant doesn't have any karma anymore. He has kiriya, it just, it's just respond. He doesn't have a reaction anymore. He have the correct respond. So whatever comes, he just responds appropriately. Because he no longer have Gilesa. He, his Gilesa is finished. He just, he just be automatically in the Dhamma. He, he lies with the Dhamma. He's just waiting for his time for Nibbana. He's just waiting to put down his, his five khanda. Uh, so he just spend the rest of the time teaching, basically. Yeah. Okay, come on, you also have potential practice and you will liberate as well. Okay, so I think that will be my uh, Dhamma reflection for you for the importance of the Kama, both mundane and super mundane. Super mundane Kama is the Makkah. So we all have the ability, we can reach that if we're practicing and we believe in the Buddha, believe in the Visakha day, that one human being practicing, uh, believe, uh, not believe, he been through that uh, first hand experience many many lifetime of this Chataka story and final life he able to put an end to it by practicing the uh, Noble Eightfold Path able to reach the Nibbana so on the same day of the Visakha he, the birth of the Buddha the end of this Gilesa and he entering final for Nibbana today so he can commemorate and we probably you also probably do activity uh, yesterday or some country to, tonight is a Visakha day depending on how you count the full moon but anyhow this this day is a very important day for our Buddhists and it's a, almost like the the liberation of human being that we can be totally free from this 
trap this sankara, you can go to the visankara. You know, visankara is the nibbana, no condition, unconditioned. So it happened on the visaka, you know, the visankara day, you know, day of putting down all this sankara. Okay, so I would like to leave the Dhamma reflection for you for tonight. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much, Ajahn for expounding on the doctrine of karma.